everybody. Welcome to the first healthcare panel at, at this event. I'm hoping the first of many to come. Um, really excited to be here. Terry Clevenger, I'm a partner with ICR. We are a um, corp com company focused in on IR and PR. Uh, my focus specifically is healthcare PR. And so uh, one of the reasons that we wanted to do this is to show the different sectors under that healthcare umbrella. And I've brought together you know, three great panelists to talk about healthcare trends and innovation and most importantly, funding innovation. So I'm gonna ask everybody just to um, introduce themselves and a little bit about what you do and then we'll get into it. Thomas? Yeah, I'm Thomas Sengart, uh, founder and CEO of Sinex Medical. Um, so Sinex is a 28-year overnight success, um, one of those. Um, and I, I think in this forum, it, it's relevant to talk about what we have done as, um, and, and also in, in context of what we just heard from the, the previous presenter. Uh, we're now looking at going private. We've been public for a number of years. And the story of Sinex is very much a story of bootstrapping. Um, I started in a one bedroom 28 years ago. Uh, and today, uh, I can say that we have uh, approximately 200 million in annual revenue. We are consistently very profitable. Uh, we have 1,100 employees and um, uh, are publicly traded on, on NASDAQ. And, and that's one of those things that uh, we're looking, because um, for a, a mid-sized, smaller company like, like Sinex, um, we, we, we definitely, in, in this current environment, not being appreciated enough. So the next step in, in us becoming um, more, more aggressive in, in, in terms of growth, in terms of uh, uh, potential acquisitions, uh, the capital markets that are available to us right now um, are, are, are fairly limited, and, and therefore we're looking at going private. Um, we continue, continue to grow 20 to 25 percent a year. And what we do is um, we are a medical device company. We, um, we have two divisions. One is focused on pain management, which is extremely important right now considering the, uh, the opioid crisis. And uh, we're fortunate enough there to, um, to, to have such a positive cash flow that we've been able to fund uh, a second division of hospital monitoring products. Um, we, have, we have four product lines on the way that are not generating any revenue yet. Um, the, the most prominent, I, sh I should mention, is uh, we, have, we have acquired a, uh, a technology, a, a, a company that has uh, figured out how to do pulse oximetry right. Pulse oximetry, uh, we, we all know with the, you, you get the finger clamp on when you get to the hospital, and uh, for the most it works. Uh, and uh, the problem today is that uh, the, the products that are on the market are very, very unreliable. Uh, they're very prone to, uh, to mis, mis, misread, if, uh, depending on skin color and a number of other conditions. Um, and, and fortunately, we have a product that actually works very accurately on the way, and, and, and we hope already next year to, to get uh, the FDA's blessing uh, on, on that product. So we've been able to, um, as part of the bootstrapping where I, uh, I've got small bank loans, then you eventually, we went public um, on the OTC 20 years ago, then uh, you use a little bit of equity, then you, you use lending again, and then you issue more stock uh, in another round of financing, and the next round is, uh, is, is, is to go private, is uh, at least our plan. Thank um, you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Robert, thanks. Great, well thanks for, um, Inviting me down, Terry. I'm Robert Jackson, I'm the CEO of Sparrow Pharmaceuticals. We are a small, privately held, kind of classic venture capital backed uh, drug development biotech. Uh, my background briefly I'm a recovering civil engineer, uh, but I've been in this pharma industry for about 23 years. The last 15 of it working with very similar companies to Sparrow small, private, venture backed, all drug development uh, biotech. So, um, kind of been swimming in that venture capital, private equity world uh, for the last couple of decades. Right. And Robert Maxwell. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, as Terry said, my name is Robert Maxwell. Uh, I started a company called ClinConnect. 
uh, a couple years ago, about five years. Um, I, lo I love the, the 28 year overnight success. <laughs> but uh, or, yeah, so Clint Connect, the idea has been you know kind of uh, gestating for for the better part of about a half a decade. Um, formalized a couple years ago, but we are a formally a, a software platform that has. Um, you know, I would say me meaningfully impacted the way that uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, recruit for their clinical trials. And then on the flip side, how patients <coughs> uh, are able to, to find the trials that are available for them uh, and then uh, work their way through the enrollment process. Thank you. So having two Roberts on here, which is, what's the odds of that? So um, bear with me if, if I'm pointing. Uh, our hope was to get, you know, we have health IT, we have drug development, and we have medical device companies here. And they all work in different ways when it comes to healthcare innovation and when it comes to funding that innovation. So Robert Jacks, I'd love to start with you in terms of, you know, you are in it for the long run. Your investors are in it for the long run. How do you keep them interested, excited, wanting to support you the whole way through? Yeah, thanks, Terry. So, the, I mean, the, the world of um, venture capital firms that support the development stage, uh, pharmaceutical development, uh, is relatively small. I think there's probably, there might be 100 funds out there in the world um, that fund kind of what we do, because you have to be very specialized to do it. Uh, I think people feel, realize there's a lot of uh, expertise in evaluating these scientific and medical innovations and really deciding what's worthwhile to invest in or not. So uh, I'm very fortunate then to work with uh, very experienced, very sophisticated investors. Um, how do I uh, interact with them, keep them interested? They're very data driven. So you know, we don't operate on a quarterly cycle, we don't operate on a, we don't have a P&L, we only have an L, right? So there's no, no profitability. Um, we operate on funding cycles, so we have a, we have a business plan, uh, we're generally be something like a three-year plan to conduct certain trials, get certain results, get certain data that, en that enable capital creation beyond that. And um, I think as long as the, the our investors see um, that we're on track, that we're doing what we said we're going to do, um, we're generating data, then um, you know, they, they remain engaged and happy. Um, I, I was struck by some of the things that were said by people in very different industries earlier, whether it's jewelry or hospitality, but some of the very same things that they said about interacting with private investors, I think, uh, are relevant uh, in my industry as well. You're trying to over-communicate. Investors don't mind uh, hiccups and setbacks. They expect those. They don't like surprises. So I think as uh, I really try to over-communicate, and uh, as long as we deliver uh, what we said we were going to do, um, they're happy. And Robert Maxwell, you're a, a, a SaaS platform for the most part. How do you, and, you, and you just launched, how do you go about talking to strategics and, and investors? What are they looking for? Yeah, so <clears throat> a couple components. Um, you know, being very tech heavy, um, you know, it's profitability for us, especially in, in any environment, but especially in this one, uh, is supremely important. Um, I, I don't think if you if you are out to, to set out or you know setting out to build a tech platform and you can't make it profitable within 90 days, you you ought to reconsider in most cases. Um, so on the financial side, there's there's that component where you know you, you you've got to make it make sense financially. Um, and investors, I think, especially like I said, in this climate, are very you know respectful of that um, and and you know uh, expect it to to, to be honest. Uh, secondarily. <clears throat> uh, usage metrics, you know, the, the, the usual suspects there um, are very important, wanting to see sustained, you know, sustained growth um, from kind of nuance to our business because we interact so closely with patients. Um, yes, you know, we want to be able to demonstrate that, you know, we're getting more patients every day than we had the day before. Um, but with that in mind, it's also really important for us, kind of core to our mission, is continuing to expand the services that we're able to provide to those patients, and then, are, you know, artfully communicating that to the market, whether that be to more patients, to investors, to strategic partners, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of how we thought about it. I don't know if I got a little yeah. aside there, but yeah. Thank you. And, and Thomas, <coughs> as a public company here, you have to show value to your investors all the time. You have to show innovation. How do you go about doing that and 
looking for capital as you move forward to launch those new innovations? Yeah, obviously, as, as a publicly traded company, everything is uh, out in the open. Every quarter, as a minimum, uh, the whole world is updated on, on what we do. Um, what I have done specifically is to, uh, to, to, to make sure that the company uh, is innovative uh, in, in terms of diversification. It's, mm -hmm. um, we, we have one product, or I should say one line of products that's materially all of our revenue uh, today. And I believe it's important for, for investors to know that we are, we are investing significantly in, in diversification. That's why we started this new division uh, of hospital monitoring products um, that, that has, uh, I mean, four product lines that have huge game-changing potential. Um, I think that's important to investors uh, in reality. I should probably say that, uh, also say that, that some investors are probably more interested in the solid financial fundamentals in the, uh, the division we built, uh, built the business on uh, versus uh, the, the, the new fancy product that uh, all have, have a big question mark to them, while other type of investors are more interested in, in, in the new technology and, and less interested in the solid fu fundamentals. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. Some like the diversification, others are like, can you just stick with one of them? Uh, so the, in, in the investment community, it's, it's, it's a mixed response to, to that. Right, right, and, and innovation can come in many different forms. So that's, mm -hmm. that's an important point. Um, let's dig into some of the you know, problem solving that you're doing. Um, Robert Maxwell, in terms of clinical trials and what is out there now, we all know that there is a huge inefficiency. So what it, you, you talked to about the, um, the cost of core recruitment. How do you, how does you, how does Click Connect go about trying to solve that when you've got, you know, pharma who has tried, CROs who have tried? Yeah. It's a, it's a tough area. Sure. So I think it's important, you know, the way that when I was starting Clint Connect um, or kind of formalizing it, um, and we can get into the differentiation there in a minute, but um, the inefficiency, it's, it's easy for us not as, as we, you know, very gratefully or, or not, or luckily or not patients that are looking for trials. That inefficiency, cur you know, is, for us is equates to people not getting access to care that they deserve. Um, or that they would otherwise qualify for. And so I think it's really important to keep that in perspective. Um, so as far as the cost, again, there's always two sides to this coin. There's the, there's the pharma side and the industry side, and then there's the patient side. Um, and I think, uh, you know, financially, it, it's very expensive. 70% of trials, this, this statistic is, seems way too large, but it's, it's accurate. 70% um, <clears throat> uh, of trials don't hit recruitment targets. And it's something I, I think, and anyone in, I'm surprised 30% do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly, <laughs> right. Uh, so it's quite challenging to actually, if you set a target, I need 250 patients in a phase two, 70%, yeah, again, just looking at the statistics in aggregate, 70% uh, are not, not going to do that. They're going to have to amend and go back to the FDA or you know, change the protocols accordingly. Um, and so the cost of poor recruitment just directly is quite expensive. It's expensive to extend a study. Um, it's expensive uh, to delay development. It, it, you know, all of the kind of usual, like I said, the usual suspects there. Um, but on the flip side too, it's, it's th th these, these are patients' lives that in many cases, especially in acute disorders and in long-term chronic and rare diseases as well. I mean, that it's, 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 not, it's not a good thing. It's something that needs to be fixed. And I think, I don't, did you ask me about how he impacted or <laughs> did I just get taken <laughs> off on no, the side? That's fine. <laughs> yeah. I'm really just talking about the, the cost of, of Poor okay. From yeah. All the different levels. That's right. Yeah. It's it's very financially expensive. It quite, you know the, the delays are not cheap. And then on the flip side again too, it's it's, it's quite impactful for the patients and in a pretty bad way. So. Robert, I know you have something to say on this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, so the cost of clinical trials, the cost to develop drugs. I mean, it's relevant to everybody, and it's in the news because it does have an impact on the cost of the price of drugs. Um, and yet, we've been talking about this for 20 years, and it gets more costly and, and takes longer all the time. I don't know what the Tufts numbers are up to now, but you know, billions of dollars and, and decades on average. So, you know, why aren't we making progress? Um, and I think, you know, in my perspective, there's kind of three buckets, three reasons why this is so difficult. Um, the first is we're dealing with biology, 
which I think human biology really hasn't fundamentally changed in something like 10,000 years. Um, so this is not you know, IT, um, where there's, there's no Moore's law in biology. So uh, when you're trying to Im impact uh, you know, diseases and want to see clinical benefit, that just takes a certain amount of time. You can't really accelerate it. The second is that we're such a heavily regulated industry. And more regulations, more requirements are added all the time. Um, and I'm not here to criticize the FDA. They have their job to do. Uh, their priority one, two, and three is patient safety. It's you know, somewhere down to 10 is getting innovative products to the market. So, uh, and that's, that's fine, that's their job, but it, just, it just, it's so difficult. And again, the contrast to IT, I think some IT people have seen opportunity and efficiency in healthcare and tried to move fast and break things, and you end up with like Theranos, right? So it just doesn't really work, translate over necessarily. Um, and then the third is the execution and, and, and uh, uh, trial enrollment, participant uh, finding patients. And it's just, it's incredibly difficult. And so that's where you're seeing some innovation like ClinConnect, people coming in and trying to work on that piece where some of the others are, uh, are more difficult to, to, to tackle. So uh, you know, we're, we're constantly uh, battling trying to identify patients and that's just a huge, um, huge issue. You'd think with some social media and technology this would be getting easier. Um, you know, people do try and utilize those tools. I'd actually, I'll tell you your perspective on it, but you know, we just set up a Facebook ad to try and find people with this rare disease, but it turns out Facebook has now put in place rules where you can't use things like disabilities and disease to identify people anymore. So, um, you know, that's, so I think this, some of these things we run into each other, but I'd love to hear your perspectives on, on some of the new technology and tools and how they're impacting that area. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's funny you say that, because again, you know, the, the, the same mechanisms by which you would be able to accurately and very specifically target uh, populations of, of, of you know of patients, Meta, Facebook, they they come in, to X, Twitter, they all they just say no, you know that's that's too specific, that's too invasive, that's too intrusive. We're not going to allow it. That's fine. That's their you know prerogative. That's their business and, and their rules to make. Uh, but with that in mind, I mean it's it's uh, quite problematic. I, I think from from the from, you know the, the the sponsor's perspective. So yeah, and and comments with your medical device, I mean, clinical trials are for us a little bit different, but still Absolutely. you're Absolutely, I, I see the treat. exact same problem. Yeah. The, the cost per patient in terms of recruiting and, and those that actually get through to actually participate in the study, the, the costs keep going up. Uh, so uh, in, right. in, in devices, it's the same right. thing. Yeah. Right. And I did want to mm -hmm. also talk a little bit about, um, it seems like a switch, but the opioid crisis in, the U in here, US today and globally, and one of the things that your group has done at Zynex is really focus on uh, non-opioid pain management. And yet, but you've taken it to another level as well, and the importance of trying to get that news out there in terms of, you're a medical device company, you do work on that, but at the same time, there is a whole social responsibility. That's right. Uh, at, at Zynex, we have, we've treated uh, more than a million patients now, and and obviously that has reduced the use of, of opioids inherently because there, there are no side effects from using our products. Um, but as, as you mentioned, uh, personally, I've also started a, uh, a foundation to, to do more about it than just deliver devices, et, et, et cetera. And um, it, it's called the Sandguard Foundation. And um, we, uh, one of the many things we have, we have done is uh, help distribute naloxone and Narcan to the front lines whether it's, it's police cars, schools, and, and many other public uh, environments. And, and we have distributed uh, nearly a million uh, doses of, of, of those. And, and we know, we just got an update the other day, that more than 300,000 of those have actually been used. So that could uh, basically count that we have saved that many lives so far. And it, 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 wow. it's, it's just one of many things we do in the foundation. And I know Kyle, uh, my, my Chief Executive is going to talk about that later today. Oh yeah, the, yeah. yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. So I also sponsored a uh, a movie with some some very famous actors in it that will premiere here in January. It's called Junction, and and talks or, or, or describes the lives of, of, of three individuals: a um, a pharmaceutical executive, um, a um, a doctor that unfortunately ends up feeling forced to, to prescribe uh, opioids and, um, and, and, and also a, a, a patient, someone that, that ends up suffering from, from this terrible addiction. Look forward to seeing that, excited mm -hmm. to see that. Um, so I know we only have a couple of minutes, mm -hmm. but um, I would love from each of you just 
what your predictions in 2024 are? Like, wh what are we seeing? What will we see next year? I'm going to start with you, Robert. Oh, geez. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I, I mean, look, I think in 24, well, there, there, there are a couple of different lenses through which you can look at, at the year or at any time frame. I think macro for me, I, I actually come from an asset management background. I worked for a family office and had a, for, for better part of a decade and had an investment firm shortly after that where I had a few months head start on COVID where I shoved the portfolio for a respiratory asset. So um, that was, you know, that's my background pre Clint Connect. But I, so I think from a macro perspective, it's, um, it's gonna, gonna be tedious. So I'm just gonna step away from that. But I think specifically with regard to healthcare and funding, you know, the nice thing about healthcare is there is a, a, a degree of um, it, it being kind of market agnostic in some capacity. I mean, there's always going to be a drug for good, uh, a market for good drugs. Um, and, and, and good IP more broadly. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, if you look at specifically CROs, which I know we, we haven't spent a ton of time talking about, that, that they really just kind of follow the liquidity in, in the uh, R&D space in, in, in biotech and biopharma because they get paid basically downstream of, this, you know, uh, of the dollars end to, to those businesses. Um, I think 24 will continue, I mean, I, look again, we're, we're, we're sidestepping a really uh, a, a macro picture that we'll just call it quite volatile. We don't know what's going to happen, um, as, as we technically never do. This one seems a little bit more eerie, maybe, to me. Um, but I do think that specifically with regard to healthcare, you're going to see outperformance. Um, I think that <clears throat> the investment dollars in will be shockingly high, again, on a relative basis. But um, yeah, I think for us, it's just going to, we're going to continue to stay the course and, you know, build our business. Good to hear. Robert? Yeah, I'll also um, kind of pass on trying to predict the macro environment. Um, and I'll say I agree that I think healthcare is a little bit insulated from the effects of that macro environment. Not completely, because I think valuations, as we heard earlier from the other New Yorker, you know, crap flows downhill. Um, but so, so that you are, it is somewhat impacted. But there's, there's money available. And I'm very bullish in general on investing in healthcare. Um, I think what worries me the most is if we, as a society, kind of kill the incentives for innovation. Um, that could be very dangerous, and I think some, some legislation that wasn't particularly well thought through over the last couple of years uh, worries me. But as long as we don't kind of kill the incentives for innovation, the science out there is amazing, the breakthroughs you're seeing, just if you, it blows your mind, we can do a gene therapy and, and certain modalities. So I'm very bullish on that, and there's, there's certainly money available uh, for uh, good data, good science. I mean, I'm hearing that. Uh, I think the investors uh, that I speak to actually like the environment now better than they did a couple of years ago because they have the time to actually diligence opportunities uh, and their valuations have come down. They feel like they can actually get uh, uh, better terms uh, and they have money to put to work. So they're being more careful or they can do so, but I think good data, good science uh, will continue to be funded. That's good to hear. Thomas? Uh, yes. Sinex as a publicly traded company is obviously very, very dependent on the uh, overall macro uh, environment. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty right now. I don't, I don't think that's exactly why our stock is uh, uh, trading a lot lower than, than it probably should. Um, but we, um, the, the overall environment is very important for, for any publicly traded company. And uh, if, if, if we manage uh, to, to go private or not, um, it's, it's still yet to be seen. So we are operating basically uh, based on, on, on how things are right now. And it, it could yeah. be, be several years uh, of uncertainty. Relatively high interest rates certainly impacts uh, ex ex external funding. So uh, raising capital on, uh, in, in a normal pipe or, or anything like that um, is it's, it's probably not in the cards here in the near term. Okay. Well, watch this space. I think it'll be an interesting, uh, bumpy ride like next year, but looking forward to it. Thanks so much.